Welcome to the first video for chapter seven, where we will be discussing the vitamins. Learning objectives for this video are to discuss the differences between fat soluble and water soluble vitamins and learn about the fat soluble vitamins, which include vitamin D, vitamin E, vitamin K, and vitamin A sometimes called DECA vitamins. The water-soluble vitamins are gonna come in the second video for this chapter, so we won't be covering it here. In this video, we're gonna hear about vitamins and provitamins. Vitamins are essential non-caloric compounds, so we need to obtain them from the diet, but they don't provide any calories, no energy. Vitamins are indispensable to body functions and are needed in tiny amounts. So they're very, very important, but we don't need a whole lot of them to make things work. Provitamins are compounds in food that can be converted to an active vitamin, also called precursors. So we, we consume them in one form and then our body will transform them into the active vitamin once it's in there. The example we'll see in this lecture is beta carotene, which we find in carrots, will eventually become vitamin A in the body. Our vitamins are classified as fat soluble or water soluble. The fat soluble, which I called DECA are absorbed into the lymph first, just like the fat we find in food. They are stored well in the body. Toxicities are possible with supplement use and each has a very unique function. On the other hand, water soluble, which we're gonna see in the next video, include B vitamins and vitamin C. These are absorbed directly into the bloodstream, just like our proteins and carbohydrates. Most are not stored in the body. Toxicities are unlikely, even with supplement use, and they have many overlapping roles. So with this slide, you can compare and contrast the different vitamins. And I can almost guarantee there'll be a question about this on your first exam, second exam rather. Welcome to the first video for chapter seven, where we will be discussing the vitamins. Learning objectives for this video are to discuss the differences between fat soluble and water soluble vitamins. And then we will learn about the fat soluble vitamins, which include vitamin D, E, K, and A, sometimes called the DECA vitamins. Water soluble vitamins are gonna come in the second video for this chapter. In this video, we'll hear about vitamins and provitamins. Vitamins are essential non-caloric compounds, meaning we must obtain them from our diet, but they don't provide any energy. Vitamins are indispensable to body functions and are needed in tiny amounts. So they're very, very important, but we don't need a whole lot of them. Provitamins are compounds in food that can be converted to an active vitamin in the body. So we consume them as one thing, and then once they are in the body, they can be altered to become an active vitamin. They're also called precursors, and the example that we'll see in this lecture is beta carotene, which we find in things like carrots and sweet potatoes. It will eventually become vitamin A in the body. Vitamins are classified as being fat-soluble or water-soluble, and they have 
very different characteristics. Fat soluble, which includes the DECA vitamins, are absorbed into lymph first, like the fat in food. They are stored well in the body. Getting toxic levels is possible with supplement use. And each vitamin has a very unique function. Opposite of this, the water soluble vitamins, which includes B vitamins and vitamin C. These are absorbed directly into the blood like protein and carbohydrates. Most are not stored in the body. Toxic levels are unlikely, even with supplement use, and many have overlapping roles. This is how it shakes out. So you can see the names of all the B vitamins. We have vitamins as the umbrella term, and then we have water soluble vitamins and we have fat soluble vitamins. This is a list of the B vitamins. We're not gonna go through every single one. I've pulled out those that I feel are most important, but you don't have to worry about that until the next video. For now, we're gonna focus on the fat soluble, which include A, D, E, and K. These are the technical terms to the right they are not going to be necessary to remember or memorize in uh, most instances. Unless I note otherwise, I would not go crazy with memorizing every technical name for the vitamins. We're gonna start with vitamin A. It's a fat soluble vitamin. There are three active forms in the body, retinol, retinal, and retinoic acid. Most food is in the form retinol and as the provitamin, beta carotene. As a fat soluble vitamin, it's stored well in the body. And in this case, it is stored in the liver as retinol. Vitamin A comes from both plant and animal sources. Animal sources have retinol and include eggs, beef, liver, and dairy. Plant sources have beta carotene, and that is found in orange, yellow fruits and vegetables. The ones I have mentioned include carrots, sweet potatoes. Another common example would be orange and yellow bell peppers. The major function of vitamin A is playing a role in eyesight. So vitamin A helps to maintain the health of the cornea, which is this outer window of the eye, eyeball. Vitamin A also assists with the process of light perception back here in the retina. So when there is a change in light, Vitamin A helps us to process that change so we're able to restore our vision quickly. But vitamin A has other functions, including maintenance of body linings and skin, building of immune defenses, and regulation of gene expression. Deficiency is not very common in the United States, but globally, it is quite common. One of the first symptoms of vitamin A deficiency is something called night blindness. And this is when there's a failure of the eyes to adapt to changes in light. So if you go from dark to light very quickly, like you're in a dark room and someone flips the light on, you will not be able to recover your eyesight quickly. It'll take a long time for you to be able to focus and see in front of you. Long-term deficiency can result in xerosis and keratinization. These are technical terms to describe drying and hardening of the skin and eyes. And this process will result in permanent blindness. So this would be an example of advanced long-term vitamin A deficiency. You can see 
the drying of the eye significantly on the outside. And this would be the keratinization or the hardening. That is deficiency. Being a fat soluble vitamin, we also have known toxic effects. There's a high risk of vitamin A toxicity with long-term supplementation, but very low risk from foods apart from eating liver. There is no risk from eating plant-based foods, but skin can turn orange. So you don't get a beta carotene toxicity that is dangerous. You just get orange tinted skin like our beloved Donald Trump. Symptoms of vitamin A toxicity include skin rashes, hair loss, bone abnormalities, and the toxicity during pregnancy can lead to birth defects. This image is pulled from your textbook, and I have one of these for each of the vitamins that we cover. I think it's a good way to summarize each vitamin. So you can see the DRI, which is good to know, but you don't need to memorize. Same thing with the upper intake level. But you also have the functions, the deficiency, and the toxicity, which we just covered. And then you get common food sources. So you can see the uh, plant-based sources and the animal-based sources on the same page. For vitamin D, this is one that is not considered an essential vitamin, and that's because we don't need to obtain it from the diet. Vitamin D can be obtained with adequate exposure to the sun, and with that adequate exposure, we can produce enough on our own. Vitamin D is found naturally in fatty fish like salmon and tuna, as well as egg yolk. And food manufacturers will add it to food products, products through the process of fortification. An example of a food that is often fortified with vitamin D is milk. You often see milk advertised with vitamin D. It's important to know that milk does not naturally contain vitamin D. It is added through the process of fortification. This is the process by which we produce vitamin D through the sun. I feel like some people think that there is something in the sun's rays, like the sun shoots vitamin D out and we just grab it. It's not the case. You actually have vitamin D in your skin and the sun's rays, the UV rays, just happen to activate it. So you have this compound in your skin, you expose the skin to the sun, it activates it one step, passes through the liver, which activates it again, then it passes through the kidney and it becomes its active form. And as we'll see when we talk about the functions, it plays a major role in calcium homeostasis. Interesting thing to note is that if you have issues here, right, liver dysfunction or kidney dysfunction, that is going to affect the metabolism of vitamin D. And so this can become an issue when dealing with patients or people with different conditions or diseases. The major function of vitamin D is that it helps to regulate calcium levels in the blood. When calcium levels drop and are low, vitamin D acts at three locations to increase calcium levels. So our body will sense that calcium is low and it will signal vitamin D to increase int uh, intestinal absorption of vitamin D, 
it will pull calcium from the bones and then prevent the kidneys from releasing it from the body. So it will tell the kidneys to hold on more. Other functions of vitamin D is that it acts as a hormone in cell growth, cell division, and cell differentiation, which is basically giving the cell its unique characteristics. Vitamin D may also be protective against things like heart disease, some cancers, infection, diabetes, autoimmune disease, and Alzheimer's. But the available evidence for these ailments is limited and investigation is ongoing. Basically, when you look at vitamin D levels of individuals and their risk of getting these uh, ailments, low vitamin D levels are associated with the increased risk. And so we know that vitamin D seems to have some kind of role, but it's not quite clear exactly what that role is in some instances. Unlike vitamin A, where deficiency is rare in the US, vitamin D deficiency is rather common in the US. This can be diagnosed through blood level of something called 25-hydroxy vitamin D. It's a pretty standard lab test that doctor's offices can run. Long-term deficiency of vitamin D can result in bone abnormalities. In children, the deficiency disease is called rickets. And in adults, the deficiency disease uh, or condition is osteomalacia, which is a softening of the bones, and osteoporosis, which is a hollowing of the bones. There's a difference in the names for children and adults. On the left, you can see normal bones for a child with rickets. The consequences include these bone abnormalities, which are manifested in these different uh, growth patterns. So you can see a bowing of the legs either up here with the femur, or you can see a bowing down at the knee joint. This one, I believe, is less common, but this... Uh, the knees caving in. So this would be caused by long-term vitamin D deficiency in children. Here's an example of what osteoporosis looks like. So you can see a solid healthy bone on the left, osteoporosis, the hollowing of the bone. So you start to lose that mineralization from vitamin D deficiency. And this bone on the right is going to be very fragile, easy to break. We do have vitamin D toxicity. This will not occur through sunlight or food, but can occur with a supplement. With our skin, we get to a certain point that the body will no longer convert to active vitamin D. If taking a supplement, you should confirm the appropriate dose with a qualified health professional. In most instances with vitamin D toxicity, it comes from people who read things on the internet and go rogue by taking very high and inappropriate doses. Toxicity increases blood calcium levels, which can lead to calcification of soft tissues. So you actually increase your calcium level to a point that it can start depositing on uh, different areas inside your body. Here's our summary slide. Again, no reason to remember the DRI, uh, but it is important to know the chief functions and the consequences of deficiency. Our best source, of course, is sunlight, but we also have our food sources as well.
On to vitamin E. Vitamin E refers to a group of compounds called the tocopherols. There are four tocopherols, but the primary tocopherol is alpha tocopherol. That's a lot of tocopherols to say. Vitamin E is found naturally in plant oils, nuts, seeds, and whole grains. And one thing of note is that it's easily destroyed by heat. So when you fry foods in oil, that vitamin E can be destroyed. The function of vitamin E is that it helps to mitigate inflammation by acting as an antioxidant. So this prevents compounds called free radicals from damaging cells and tissues. Free radicals are just these things that wreak havoc on our body. And so antioxidants help to lessen the damage that's caused by them. Now we all have free radical production inside our body, but our lifestyle and our food choices can either slow down the damage or accelerate it. This is what antioxidants look like. So you have a free radical that's going to attack like a fatty acid, DNA, protein, or cholesterol. Um, and it's gonna set off a chain reaction of events. Antioxidants stand in a way stand in the way to prevent that chain reaction from occurring. So instead of this free radical setting off the dominoes, the antioxidant stays in a way and stops that reaction from occurring. So these are the results of unmitigated free radical damage. You can really hurt your cells and lead to significant inflammation but antioxidants such as vitamin E are gonna stop that chain reaction. Vitamin E deficiency and toxicity are both rare. Vitamin E deficiency is extremely rare in humans and most of what we know about it, or at least the symptoms of it, is from studies in animals. Vitamin E, just like vitamin A and D, will not occur from food, but can with a supplement. This can increase clotting times and therefore increase risk of hemorrhage or significant bleeding. And this is our summary slide. For this one, I just wanted to add this one more thing from your textbook that shows, well, we don't have outright deficiency or symptomatic deficiency in the US, our intake generally falls below what is recommended. And so if you look at the foods that uh, we consume, you know, whole grains, nuts, seeds, and oils that are not cooked at very high temperatures, uh, we don't do quite so good with those. On to the fourth and final fat soluble vitamin, vitamin K. Vitamin K is obtained through food and it is produced by the gut bacteria. So we can satisfy some of our requirement with that which is produced by the gut bacteria, but not all of it. So it is still considered an essential nutrient. Vitamin K is found in highest amounts in leafy green vegetables, foods like spinach, kale, cabbage, and broccoli are excellent sources. Vitamin K assists in the activation of proteins that clot the blood. So it can be uh, used medically during surgery to prevent hemorrhage, which I said before is that significant bleeding. Vitamin K is also necessary for the synthesis of key bone proteins. 
this is often a forgotten com component of promoting bone health. So when we think of bone health, we usually think of calcium and vitamin D, but vitamin K is also a very important part of that equation. Vitamin K deficiency and toxicity are both uh, rare in humans. The major exception is newborn infants, which benefit from a vitamin K injection. It is common practice here in the United States that when a baby is born, a nurse will come in with a needle and inject that newborn baby with vitamin K. This is to prevent hemorrhage from occurring. Now, in recent years, there has been some resistance to this practice, which seems to stem from the same community as anti-vaccinations. I think it's important to know that the use of vitamin K for newborn babies is a very significant medical advancement and is widely considered to be useful. In other words, it's probably not such a good idea to resist, even though it is difficult to see a baby be injected with a needle. And here's our summary slide for vitamin K. Again, leafy green vegetables are our best source of vitamin K. And so they should be consumed generously throughout the day, not just for vitamin K, but for all sorts of reasons. The other vitamins and minerals and the fiber. So those were our four fat soluble vitamins. Thank you guys for watching. When I do part two, that will cover the water-soluble vitamins.